Good afternoon and welcome to Downing Street for today's coronavirus briefing. I'm joined by Dr. Jenny Harris, the Chief Executive of the UK Health Security Agency, and by Professor Steve Powers, the Medical Director of NHS England. We've always known that the winter months would pose the greatest threat to our road to recovery. The darker skies, the colder weather provide perfect conditions, not just for COVID-19 to thrive, but for other seasonal viruses too, like flu and norovirus. And ahead of winter, just as we expected, we're starting to see this impact. Cases arriving, and yesterday we reported 43,738 new cases across the UK, up 16% from the previous week. And they could go yet as high as 100,000 a day. We're also seeing greater pressure on the NHS. Across the UK, we're now approaching 1,000 hospitalizations per day. The NHS is performing with distinction, and I'd like to thank everyone who's working so hard to keep us safe. And we'll do what it takes to make sure that this pressure doesn't become unsustainable and that we don't allow the NHS to become overwhelmed. Deaths remain mercifully low, but they are still, sadly, over 100 a day. This pandemic is not over. Thanks to the vaccination program, yes, the, the link between cases and hospitalizations and deaths has significantly weakened, but it's not broken. So we must all remember that this virus will be with us for the long term and that it remains a threat, a threat to our loved ones and a threat to the progress that we've made in getting our nation closer to normal life. We're looking closely at the data and we won't be implementing our plan B of contingency measures at this point. But we'll be staying vigilant, preparing for all eventualities while strengthening our vital defenses that can help us fight back against this virus. And today, as we approach this critical time for our nation's recovery, I wanted to bring you up to date with some of the work that we're doing to strengthen these defenses as we learn to live with the virus. One line of defense is treatments, and I have some positive news to share today. We should all be proud that the UK has been at the forefront of some of the most cutting edge treatments. COVID-19 treatments have already had an amazing impact and they're especially important for people who can't take vaccine for medical reasons or if they are immunocompromised. It was British scientists who led the clinical trial that discovered dexamethasone th that can be an effective treatment for COVID-19 and it's already estimated to have saved some 1 million lives across the world. And some of the most vulnerable NHS patients in hospital are already benefiting from Ronaprev, a treatment of monoclonal antibodies that was specifically designed to treat COVID-19. We're also seeing some promising developments around antivirals too. You see, antivirals work by targeting a virus at an early stage and disrupting the way the virus develops and multiplies. I'm pleased to announce that we have signed two landmark deals, securing hundreds of thousands of doses of two new antivirals from Pfizer and from Merck Sharp Dome. These antivirals have the potential to speed up recovery time and to stop infections from progressing. If these treatments get MHRA approval, then we can provide some of the most vulnerable patients with vital protection this summer. And I want to deploy them as quickly as possible. I'd like to thank everyone that's been involved in this, especially the Antivirals Task Force under the leadership of Eddie Gray for everything that they've done to make this happen. And we'll keep working to secure even more of these incredible treatments so that we can continue to protect as many people as possible. This is great news, but we cannot be complacent when COVID-19 remains such a potent threat. 
Ever since our phenomenal vaccine program began last winter, we've been in a race, a race between the vaccine and the virus. And although we're ahead in that race, the gap is narrowing. We've come so far, thanks to the efforts of so many, but with winter ahead, we can't blow it now. So we're going to do everything we can to maintain our lead by strengthening our vaccination program as our primary line of defense. First, we'll redouble our efforts to encourage anyone who's eligible to take up the initial offer of a jab. There's almost 5 million people over the age of 16 that remain unvaccinated in the UK. It might be someone you know, a friend, a family member, a colleague. And if you do, tell them that it's never too late to come forward. So if you yet haven't had your jab, please take this huge step to protect yourself and to protect your loved ones. Second, we've extended the offer of a vaccine to more and more people, including young people aged between 12 and 15 years. And we'll be making it easier for them to get protected by opening up our national booking service so they can get their jab at a vaccination centers across the country, as well as at school. Third, we've also started rolling out our booster program, which is vital to keeping us safe over the coming months. Because although our vaccines offer powerful protection, we now know that the protection that you get from a COVID vaccine reduces materially over time, especially in older people who are at the greatest risk. And without delivering a top up of protection through a booster dose, we will see a real world impact. As well as this, COVID-19 mutates like any virus, and we're identifying new variants all the time. This includes a new version of the Delta variant, which is currently known as AY 4.2, and that new variant is now spreading. And while there's no reason to believe at this point that AY 4.2 poses a greater threat, the next variant, or the one after that, might do. So we need to be ready for what lies around the corner. This means our ongoing program of booster jabs is so important, and this winter, we're prioritizing those most in need. Today, we've reached a milestone of four million top-up jabs in England, but we need to get even more people protected. We've got the jabs. We just need the arms to put them in. If you've got 50, if you're over 50, or in another priority group, and had your second jab over six months ago, you're eligible for a booster. And the NHS will send you an invite. If you haven't been invited within a week of reaching that six month milestone, then please get onto the National Booking Service and book online or phone 119. Not just to save lives, but to keep your freedoms too because all of these precious moments that we've been able to restore over the past few months, the loved ones that we've been able to see and the collective experiences that we've been able to share, they've been possible thanks to our vaccination program and because of so many of you that came forward when it was your time. And if we want to secure these freedoms for the long term, then the best thing that we can do is come forward once again, when that moment comes. After the decisive steps that we've taken this year, none of us want to go backwards now. So we must all play our part in this national mission and think about what we can do to make a difference. That means getting the jab when the time comes, whether it's for COVID-19 or flu. But although vaccinations are our primary form of defense, there are many more things that we can all do to help contain the spread of this virus. Like you know, meeting outdoors where it's possible. And if you can only meet indoors, letting in fresh air. 
like wearing a face covering in crowded and enclosed spaces, especially if you're coming into contact with people that you don't normally meet, and like making and taking rapid tests as they're making them as part of your weekly routine. A quarter of the positive cases that we are now identifying come from those lateral flow tests that people are taking without symptoms, but they're taking them as a precaution, especially if they're about to go and meet a loved one, perhaps a grandparent or another vulnerable person. With winter soon upon us, these little steps make a big difference. And they're more important now than they have ever been. If we all play our part, then we can give ourselves the best possible chance in this race, get through this winter, and enjoy Christmas with our loved ones. Thank you. I'd now like to hand over to, to Jenny, who will take us through some of the latest COVID-19 data. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary of State. Could I have the first slide, please? Um, so I think what I'm going to do is just highlight where we are in the epidemiological picture uh, today, but also highlight some of those successes from the vaccination, but also some of the risks that lay ahead of us this winter. Um, and the first slide is showing us the number of individuals who've had at least one positive COVID-19 test result. This is right across the UK and brings us up to uh, the 20th of October. Uh, and what we can see there is that the, uh, since yesterday, we have had 49,139 people tested positive. Now, the number here, the 45,799, is our average through the week, which is entirely appropriate. We get dips and, and peaks. Uh, but if I just go back one week to, uh, to the 13th of October, the number then was 42,776. So what you will see is there's quite a steep increase as we go forward. Uh, in the number of cases. And I'd just like to flag on this, the unusual uh, and, and slightly worrying picture uh, of the shape of that curve. What we can see is that the cases now are almost as high as they were in July and actually not far off where they were last winter. What we are not seeing is that dip down again at the other side of the peak. And that is really important because uh, we are kicking off the winter at a really high level of cases. Uh, Fortunately, that is not currently working through into uh, serious uh, disease and deaths, but we will come on to that in a moment. Uh, so could I have the next slide, please? So this uh, slide shows the number of people in hospital with COVID-19, again, right across the UK. Uh, and this has increased by 10.3% since last week. So again, we are seeing that movement forward. Um, we would expect uh, a high point after rising cases to come about two weeks after a peak. And again, if you look at the, the bottom on the right-hand side, you can see uh, where the cases peaked uh, previously in July, uh, in middle of August, you can see that there's a peak there. Again, what hasn't happened is those cases have not decreased. They've continued at a fairly high level. Um, and in actual fact, in the last few days, they are continuing to increase. So uh, on, uh, we had 7,891 people uh, in hospital on the 19th of October. Again, if we go back a week, only just over 7,000, 7,057. So again, a steady increase at the moment, and this is as we approach the winter months. And if we just compare, if we go back to hospital uh, in, in January, the peak then was around 39,200. Uh, so we can see we're a long way off that, but it's a very different epidemiological picture. Uh, next slide, please. And then sadly, we look at the deaths. So we know that there was a, a very high uh, death toll uh, in the first uh, wave of the pandemic and the total deaths, uh, which we've sadly recorded since the start of the pandemic are now just over 139,000. Um, and these relate to uh, people who've had a positive COVID, COVID test within 28 days uh, of death. Uh, again, what we can see here is the most recent seven-day average is 136 deaths. It's very flat compared with the first wave, but it's clearly every, every life is of significance. And I think one of the more significant points about this is uh, we have had, in the last two days, the highest uh, rates we've had for some time. So just in the last 24 hours, 179 deaths recorded. So again, these are moving in the wrong direction. We can see the effect, the really strong effect of vaccination, which it's difficult to believe just wasn't here this time last year, but still moving in the wrong direction. Next slide, please. 
And then this is why we see that difference. We have had um, a, a huge rollout uh, of vaccination. This chart shows the cumulative uptake uh, of individuals who've received their first dose, that's uh, in uh, blue, and then who've received two doses, that's in orange. Um, and in total, uh, over 49 and a half indivi million individuals have received that first dose and over 45 a million the second. So we now have in the uh, 12 plus age group right the way through uh, adulthood, 86.1% uh, of our population have had that first dose and 79% uh, the second dose. But clearly uh, from the uh, information that we've had before, the fact that we're now approaching winter and the fact as the Secretary of State has said, there are still people out there who have not had a first dose which will uh, significantly uh, protect them. Uh, there's still plenty uh, of opportunity to come and get that. Um, and if we look on the next slide, uh, which shows us how the booster vaccination program is doing. Uh, so these are the uh, vulnerable groups, that's the elderly, uh, individuals in care homes, those with uh, underlying uh, conditions. And you can see here that we have reached over 4 million individuals having their booster dose. Um, and I know Professor Powers can, can add some detail to that as we go forward. Now this is for England only data. Um, and um, it's increased from 860,000 on the 30th of September. So that is rolling out very rapidly now as we uh, move forward to cover all of those at higher risk. Um, and then on the final slide, uh, I just want to highlight how important that vaccination is. What we can see here um, are COVID-19 cases coming into emergency care within 28 days of a positive test. Um, and these are uh, individuals where that uh, um, hospital uh, uh, intervention uh, resulted in an inpatient admission. So these are people who have had to seek care. And what you can see is, in terms of vaccination status, the, the dark blue lines are those individuals who are unvaccinated. Uh, and the uh, orange lines are those people who have had two doses. Um, and I think there is, it's clear that as you uh, get more elderly, you have uh, a number of other conditions. Um, and, but even then, the protection that is afforded to the older people is significant. But for younger people, I think there is a really important message here, which is you have very, very little risk if you have two doses of vaccine, uh, but you have a significant risk if you have had none.